Hi, and welcome to another episode of Tom Ray's Art Podcast. I'm Tom. On today's episode, we have an artist that I speak to from Canada. Now, this artist uh, started out as a photographer and uh, was going to go into graphic design, but there were different paths that led them to create the work that they actually do, which is 3D sculpture. And 3D sculpture on canvas with ink and uh, paints, but also with paper, different types of paper. And uh, the way it came about was actually through just a sort of process that broke down and then a discussion that he had with, with the fiance. It's, it was, it's an interesting uh, way that it works into uh, what it became, how it came about, and uh, the work itself is very interesting. So uh, we have a great conversation, and here it is on the podcast starting right now. I'm George Bernecki. I am a three-dimensional collage painter and maybe multidisciplinary artists. So I take on different kinds of creative projects uh, by using the foundation of my ink collages in different ways that involve uh, generally digital medias. Okay. And where are you located right now? Yeah, Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, Canada. So it's uh, it's the center province in Canada. Okay. Saskatoon's... Wait, wait, say it again? <laughs> I feel like that's a tongue twister to me. Saskatoon... Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, okay. Canada. Okay. Yeah. That's, I don't know if I've ever known those to be, I, I feel, sorry, I'm, now I'm just getting hung up on the two names sounding similar to me. It's not important. Uh, so how, <laughs> how did you uh, get started? How did you start making this work that you're doing right now? For sure. Well, yeah. And one also point to uh, Adam Sandler's a big fan of Saskatchewan. So if you have uh, seen a few of his video or okay. his movies, he... He loves the name too, so people get hung up on it all the time. No, it was really um, fun to hear you say, yeah. and I and then I'm just like, wait, am I getting hung up on that? Okay, good. I'm not the only one. <laughs> You're not the only one. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um. I so I I got started. Um. Well, originally my first love was photography and graphic design. So. Oh. Uh, that was kind of what I did throughout high school and uh, had very strong plans of moving out to Vancouver right after that to pursue graphic design. Um, just very, you know, kind of very like work within a company, yeah. um, you know, complete different tasks, complete different projects. And, um, I, you know, I, I, I kind of ventured, you know, and I started doing that right at the start. And I kind of noticed that there was uh, a little bit of creative freedom that was lost within that profession, um, just in regards to a little bit more of the independence of a creative. And I kind of found that um, that might be a limiting thing that uh, might really bother me if I decide to do this long term. So I made a little bit of a switch um, to start pursuing fine art. Um, there was a little bit more agency to kind of produce exactly what I wanted. So um, yeah, my, my bachelor of fine arts was um, across three different universities in Canada. So uh, I spent some time yeah, it, it was very kind of up and down um, in, in regards to maybe just not 100% knowing exactly what I wanted within my art practice. Um, but, you know, that kind of like very intrinsic, um, very undefinable feeling and like a sense of like you need to do this, you need to create. Um, but having a very love-hate relationship with that, that's what happened within my uh, university experience is that I had such a strong desire to do it. And then I kind of over... I, I overdid it and okay. then didn't want to do it anymore. And I did that a few different times. Okay. Then so that's why I you ended up little... at three different places or precisely. Yeah. Okay. All yeah. right. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I spent a little bit of time in uh, South Katoon. Uh, I went to school uh, there for about a year and then I went to Calgary, Alberta uh, for two and a half years technically dropped out of that school, came back to Saskatoon, studied a year of philosophy um, oh. with full intentions of never being an artist again. Um, absolutely just kind of like um, had a really sour taste of what it took to be kind of a contemporary artist in, in the world. Um, you just know, kind of school. It, yeah. Well, you know, with fine arts education, um, the first two years are very guided, you know, you get mm -hmm. the themes that you're going to deal with the mediums because it's explorative. Um, but then in the third year for Canadian universities, it's a lot of, uh, you know, do whatever you want, whatever you're passionate about, whatever kind of mediums, like do all that kind of stuff. Okay. Uh, but the problem with, with my, uh, 
my way of thinking at the time was that I really operated quite well, similar to like a graphic designer or photographer that just is like, here's all the steps and then produce the product. And I was yeah. like, that makes a lot of sense to me. And since I was relatively new to the other side of it, where fine art is really about like finding what you want to talk about, finding the mediums, um, it, it, uh, it created a lot of anxiety in regards to being like, I have no idea what I'm passionate about. Okay. Uh, I feel like I should know these things. So I started working uh, way too intensely at uh, the school in Calgary where I was spending, you know, six or seven days a week, you know, 10 to 12 hours a day just trying to figure out, you know, what I was passionate about and then, you know, trying every single medium, every single, uh, you know, every single technique, all that kind of stuff uh, to just eventually burning myself out. Um, and then the problem that I had with that as well is that I was getting the awards and the scholarships for that work. So my rationale was that, okay, this is what it actually takes to be a fine artist is that you need to kind of like, you need to work so hard uh and be in such a bad mental state, but it's going to be worth it because you get the awards and you get the scholarships. And I was like, okay, this isn't, this isn't working for me. So, okay. um, I, yeah. So I decided to drop out at the time. Um, yeah. Sour taste in my mouth for the art world. So I actually wanted to pursue uh, social work in the Navy. <laughs> yeah. Where the hell did that come from? <laughs> so, yeah. And uh, the the thing that I was thinking about at the, the time is this, like, what is the farthest profession away from being an artist um, that I could do? That would so, probably like, be it. it yeah. <laughs> totally. So in regards to, yeah, in regards to how sour I believe the, the art world was, it was like, I don't want anything to do with it. And I've taken... Uh, a significant amount of time to find a profession that is so much away from that um, to go pursue. And so when I came back to Saskatoon, I studied a year of philosophy um, with full intent to um, serve uh, and uh, look at a profession in the Navy, which would be based out in uh, Halifax, Nova Scotia. Hmm. And uh, so through that year, very up and down in terms of if I wanted to be an artist or not. Um, but I did decide that I should finish up this Bachelor of, of Fine Arts. And I did venture out to Halifax to finish up my BFA at the time. Okay. Um, and I just didn't go out there for, for the Navy. Um, but <laughs> uh, anyway, so that progression of the BFA was uh, incredibly long, um, you know, and uh, fruitful in different kinds of ways of um be very introspective about one's life, um, understanding how someone thinks about things and how uh, the outside world influences the way that people think about things. Um, that it became a very fruitful experience, but it was just a very long process. Yeah. And then, yeah. And then my, my master's education was completed in 2022 in Vancouver, British Columbia. Uh, during the pandemic, so I went to uh, I went to Vancouver in uh, 2020 with my now fiance, um, and we basically went to school in two different universities in British Columbia during the pandemic. Okay, which was just another wild experience in its, <laughs> in its own regard. Well, and here's what I found interesting about all of that is usually people have the opposite reaction to um you were saying it seemed that you were leaning more towards graphic design and things like that whereas i've worked in agencies and while it wasn't for doing artwork or anything i was making websites and i enjoyed making websites and making functionality and trying out new things and stuff like that which is one of the reasons that i got pulled into this agency because they're like oh you know how to do this thing this new thing that we don't do and we need to do it. So I did it. And then you'd come in and you'd have a bunch of people who just got done telling you they've never done it before going, it needs to be like this. And it's like, well, no, that's not how you do it. And they're like, yes, but that's what we need. And it's like, but you don't know what you need because you've never made it. And that's usually the frustration that most artists have with being graphic designers is you're making three things to show someone all being judged by people who asked you to make something for them because they don't know how to do it. <laughs> and then they're going, okay, we want you to change this and this. And it, and that's usually the, and it's not a working by committee. It's, well, I guess it is working by committee, but it's not a collaborative thing. It's a work. Yeah. It's, it's a working by committee, not a collaborative thing. And that's mm -hmm. usually what happens with graphic designers. And you were saying you liked that. They said, we want you to do this, this, and this. And you're like, I can absolutely do that. Which truthfully, 
and I feel like I'm going through my own <laughs> my own process of of psychiatry here, but it's like that's great because who cares? You, you know, this is something they're paying you to do, and you're like, great. I'm not gonna. I'm getting paid for this. I'm not going to show it in my portfolio. It's it's mm. like here's the work. I know how to do it. There you go. Get out of here, you lug. You know, <laughs> take that artwork and go do what you want to do with it. But somehow yeah. there's the attachment. Um, but you were saying you enjoyed that. So um, so why did you? Uh, why do you not do that now? Or do you do that yeah. now as well as what you do? That's a very uh, yeah. It's a very good question. So um, before I went into the arts um i was a big fan of sports so i really loved basketball mm-hmm. um and with sports in general um you know you're coached to do something right you're coached to do something specific okay. and so um right. being in sports for quite a long time uh it started to become very ingrained in the idea that like someone else tells me what to do uh and i go do that thing and then i <laughs> either get scolded or rewarded for that And so that was a really good, uh, you know, it was good, like in regards to discipline and actually like completing tasks and getting things done. It was a very, uh, it was very fruitful experience. And that's, that's why I love sports because it's, um, it's very much about a, like a team effort, but it's also about knowing that uh, like the coach has a lot of experience in regards to how the entire dynamic works of you winning as a team and you also progressing as an individual. So like a lot of that stuff was, um, very intrinsically important to me. Uh, but when, you know, you get to your, uh, your younger twenties and you kind of start to uh, rebel and become kind of consciously aware of, uh, how different things have affected you throughout your life. Um, that's what sort of happened at that time is that it just didn't happen in sports. It happened in art. So when Mm -hmm. I was taking a lot of these different design courses and, you know, revisions needed to be done, or um, different suggestions were kind of happening. I wasn't, uh, it wasn't hitting as a um, a fruitful criticism or constructive criticism. It was very much about like, I'm trying to find my artistic voice and it's being uh, repressed in a certain sort of way. Yeah. Whether it was done out of, you know, like ill intent or anything, which it obviously wasn't, but um, it was just that kind of resistance. Um, I wasn't interested in, dealing with it anymore because i felt like i'd been doing that a lot not just in sports but just in um being a people pleasing kind of person you know it's like i didn't want to ruffle feathers in uh social um situations i didn't want to you know i didn't want to come off as like a bad kid or a bad teenager or or whatever um but you know after a certain amount of time like that yeah, it's either it's a rebellion or it's a it's a questioning of being like, I need to do something a little bit differently so that I become an individual um, that can provide something in 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 a way that's not impeded by other people's thoughts mm-hmm. of how I'm supposed to do it. Yeah. So um, I've always had, uh, like, as I reflect on a lot of my education and the way that I kind of navigate this world, it, it is very, it's very psychological. It's very introspective. Um, and philosophical because I'm, I'm so fascinated with the way uh, that people navigate life and how they come up with their own opinions on things, um, hmm. uh, their behaviors, their decisions, um, all down to even just, you know, creative ventures, right? So uh, that that's kind of how um, all of this stuff has come about. And that switch was really, really pivotal or really pivot, pivotal, pivotal uh, yeah. in regards to being like, I'm going to do, yeah, <laughs> I'm going to do things my own way. And, uh, you know, if I fail in the fine art side of things, at least I know that it was like, it was me making the mistakes or making the conscious decisions to be like, this is how I want to do it. And this is how I'll work towards, you know, creating something new or creating different ways of uh, producing work. Okay. And then, what you do now is not really something that you would think of that a person coming from wanting to be in a graphic design background would do. So first of all, how would you explain your work to people? Um, uh, I mean, to explain it <laughs> when you, when you explain what you do, what would you call it? Absolutely. So yeah. So the 3d, 3d collages, um, I really am, um, like I'm really curious about the fundamental aspects of art. So it, that does also come into play when it comes to graphic design. So, you know, how color works, 
how texture works, mm-hmm. uh, depth, shapes, those kinds of things. So there is still there's still that element of graphic design that's involved in the fine art side of things. It's just kind of um, it's just kind of changed in a certain way. So with these collage pieces that I do, you know, it's it's meticulously cutting them out with illustration knives, which is a design tool. Uh, color combinations are based on color theory. Um, with different kinds of tweaks that uh, allow my work to just be a little bit askew just because I, I find that fine art has um, has that freedom to bend and break the rules just a little bit here and there. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so the piecing together and the, the, the process of the work is still ingrained in a little bit of design elements and graphic design stuff. And then the output is a lot more... Um, yeah, it's a lot more about the, the fine art side of things, if, if I can if I can kind of say that. And then just being very genuinely curious uh, about how um, abstract art uh, allows people, like allows a viewer to really, um, their brain can go anywhere, mm-hmm. you know. And I think that's kind of the, I think that's the benefit of uh, um, the work that I'm doing is that it does allow, it allows someone to go, like allows someone's brain to go wherever it wants to go. What led to the idea of this art that you had started creating this, this method that you do now, like what led up to it? What, what sparked it? Uh, another longer story, but I'll try and make it short. Okay. (laughs) So, so halfway through my masters, I was working on an entirely different body of work, uh, inspired by this, uh, kind of illustration artist in Ontario named Jay Dart. And uh, he developed this world based around uh, this character named Jigs, who basically navigates uh, these kind of like empty plain landscapes um, inspired by um, kind of Ontario farmland, but really about the mind. So the mind is open, there's possibilities. And like, um, and so I really liked the idea of building a world um, and, you know, taking different things from uh, all of my different universities, like all my that kind of artwork that never been seen or different ideas, uh, which all kind of stemmed from that third year when I transitioned from uh, like the two years of like being told what to do. And then the third year being there's so much information. Uh, I'd love to distill it down because I only scratched the surface was what I presented to people. Yeah. So I did this whole world building exercise to basically involve every aspect of my life, my journals, my sketches, my unseen work, my sculptures, my projections, my drawings, my paintings to distill it down into this world building um, project. But when, what unfortunately happened is that it actually imploded on itself with mm-hmm. too much information. So one night uh, I was working late in the studio and I was going back to my apartment and uh, I ended up disassociating, which basically means that uh, your mind leaves your body from intense anxiety. So okay. as I was walking across the street, yeah, it was wild. As I was walking across the street, um, there, you know, the walk lines or whatever, uh, for crosswalks, my brain actually started to shift outside of those lines as my body was still walking straight. Mm-hmm. And then as I got to the other side of the sidewalk, um, the cement underneath me felt like a treadmill. So as if I was like, my body was walking, but my brain wasn't, wasn't connecting with the body. So, uh, basically what I did is I tried so hard to create this world building thing. It didn't work. My body was like, you're going to have a meltdown. So here's your, here's your dissociation. Here's your anxiety problem. And then, uh, you're going to have to be left with picking up the pieces of this imploded world. And so afterwards, um, it took about a week to kind of pick up the pieces and kind of, you know, look in my studio and be like, okay, what, what actually worked? Cause like the world building wasn't a complete failure, but there were, um, lots of pieces that could be pushed to the wayside to really distill down like the essence of like how important different elements were. Mm -hmm. And so, um, there were these cutout pieces that I had and I didn't really know what to do with them at the time. So they were just kind of posted and pasted up onto my wall. And, um, yeah, my, my fiance, she, she came into my space and she took one of these off and she put it on to one of my old artworks that wasn't working. Mm-hmm. And for some reason, that very simple observation mm-hmm. for me opened up the idea to do these like three dimensional collages. Hmm. And so, so what I kind of found, what was really important about that moment is that I was too close 
to my work to know when it wasn't working. And then I was also too close to it to actually know what was supposed to happen next. So looking to the outside in terms of um, just being like, hey, what do you see, Laurel, in regards to like what I'm doing? And like, what do you, what would you do different? Mm-hmm. And so, you know, she didn't do anything crazy, right? She was just like, oh, I like this piece. Like, what if it was right here? And that separation between... Uh, the painting and the little ink collage really just like opened up my brain to be like, if I distill all of it down and start putting these pieces together in a three-dimensional way, it really makes sense for what I want to do with my work. Okay. And then, yeah. And so, um, it, yeah, it was a, it was such an interesting time um, at that point after the world building exercise imploded on itself to yeah. then start to venture. Which is a weird statement these. to say the world building exercise yeah. imploded on itself. <laughs> like that's, yeah, <laughs> that's dark. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it was crazy. It was, it was really wild to, to work so hard on something that you truly believed was going to work. And then it didn't. And then to be right. like, well, I have, I have half a master's to figure this out. Like, am I going to drop out and be a, a social work officer in the Navy now, but on right. the West coast this time, or like, am I going to figure it out? And so, um, yeah, I felt like there was something left to, to complete within this masters. And, uh, that's, that's what started the ink collages. Okay. And now here's a question. The first thing that came to my mind, like, wow, that's fascinating the way that that came about when you started Go or when uh, you both started going, what if that went here and you were putting those pieces on there? First thing I'm thinking of is how do you keep them on there? I feel like after a week, I would just have those pieces like all over the floor. Like I would just walk in one day and be like, damn it. (laughs) How do I get? So how did you actually like, what's the process to actually create a work like this that you're doing? Uh, How do you, I mean, one for me, how do you get it to stay in place? Because they are 3d, they are parts on top of parts. Um, mm-hmm. on, on canvas for the most part that I've yeah, seen. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, um, my, my art process is, uh, very much about, uh, like contrasting elements. So the ink pieces, uh, I do very like wild gestural marks on uh, a paper called Yupo paper. Okay. Um, so it's a synthetic, it's a synthetic paper. Um, and then, so I create these very gestural marks and then I meticulously cut them out and I use these tiny little sponge adhesives. They're just double-sided uh, sponge adhesives okay. um, to basically collage the pieces together. So it, um, what I really wanted to keep in mind when I was creating this work is that the processes are not exotic. They're very simple. You know, I'm creating marks mm. with mm-hmm. ink. I'm cutting it out with uh, just a knife. And then I'm using double-sided adhesive sponges to create these layers, um, which was really beneficial for me. And it was also really beneficial because uh, it allowed me to work with whatever kind of energy I had in the tank when it came to coming into my studio. So if I had lots of energy, yeah, meticulous mark making, gestural marks, like all over the place, all that kind of stuff. But if I just came into the studio space and recognized that I didn't have a lot of energy in the tank anymore... I was putting my headphones on. I was, I had my cup of tea and I was just meticulously cutting things out, collaging them together. And so I found that that process of like really respecting how much energy you have when you come into the studio and knowing that there might be a possibility for you to work in whatever way on different parts of a similar artwork yeah, uh, was really freeing to me. Hmm. You know, I didn't have to be a hundred percent on uh, similar to like in sports, right? It's like, you have to be a hundred percent on, you can't just come in and be like, yeah, like I'll just, I'll pass around this game. Right. You know, I'm not going to shoot anything. I'm not going to score. It's like, well, that doesn't really work in sports, but the possibility of like having that slower time in art really allows the artist to think. And it really allows me to, um, utilize these two different kinds of, uh, levels of energy so to speak when it comes to creating the work yeah for some reason i wanted to make a don't skip leg day joke but um <laughs> you know, that sort of thing <laughs> like all of it's important but here's here's an interesting observation i have too so when i looked at your stuff and i did not expect that you were meticulously cutting them out i thought like it was some sort of like wearing it down or getting it to remove itself process and here's why i thought that so when i first looked at some of the looking at some of the pieces that you use and tell me if this makes any sense to you. So have you ever lit a match and then held it to the center of a piece of paper and just burnt a circle in it? 
Uh, I have not. Okay, but no. but if you have, it's an interesting thing. Like you know, you just uh, you're burning a hole, and it kind of just eventually um, just stops burning it, and it runs out of it, and it makes a weird shape, and it kind of leaves a, a ring around it where there were burn marks before it went out. Your Absolutely. pieces look like if you were to take if those parts that you burnt out existed, and they were actually just removed from the pa- the paper and left the hole those are the pieces that would be there. Kind of the way that people say donut holes, the joke is like, these are the holes that were in the donuts. You know what I mean? It's the, mm-hmm. It looks like the piece that would have been removed from the process that I just explained. But since you've never <laughs> done that, it's probably lost. But anyway, that's one of the observations I had, and I thought it was cool. So I was very curious to hear how you uh, made some of the pieces that you use, and you're just saying that you just will meticulously cut them out. And also you're staining them in a way as well a lot of the time mm-hmm. Correct. Yeah. yeah so yeah and that's that's a very good point so um i just have large sheets of upo paper um i'm very curious about uh different kinds of mark making techniques but the only thing that i use is um these copic ink refill tubes so this is like this really? is my mark making technique yeah so it's just a tiny little tiny little tip oh. and um yeah and so that's what i'm using to like draw on the paper is like i'm creating i'm creating a controlled mark (laughs) yeah (laughs) i love that (laughs) yeah and so this is kind of uh it's another one of those kind of contrasting things similar to the gestural marks and the meticulously cutting out is that i create one controlled mark and then i allow the ink to bleed and move in whatever way it's going to do and then once those different kinds of let's call them puddles like once a little puddle dries it has its own edge yeah and then those are the edges that i meticulously cut out so the shapes in regards to like i have a little bit of uh agency and control in regards to like what the shape might look like and i've developed different techniques with just very like very small like tools so you know here's my little ink sprayer so this is uh this is just isopropyl alcohol ink um and so with some of these different kinds of Copic inks, uh, obviously blue isn't just blue, right? Like there is a little bit of yellow in it. There might be even a little bit of like uh, orange depending on the hues. And what the isopropyl alcohol does is it actually pulls the unseen colors out of it through the chemical reactions. So that can kind of be, that can be seen in a lot of my uh, like black artwork. So Mm -hmm. the black uh, really takes to the isopropyl alcohol in a way that brings out these vibrant blues and vibrant oranges. So having that little bit of control and then just allowing the materials and the chemical to do what it does with the ink and then that being its process in itself and then me sitting and very just simply cutting uh, like and appreciating uh just like what this material can do yeah and then kind of piecing those together in in such a way on um these different kinds of canvases uh you know to produce some kind of composition yeah no i love that you're using the refill tubes that's so brilliant it's i mean in my head i'm like going oh you're using some sort of water brush or something no it, you yeah. just cut out the middleman and do it that yeah. <laughs> do it direct Absolutely. I love that <laughs> now when you're making yeah. these uh you have like let's say how do you start a project i know that you have projects that are sets that are themed uh about a certain process so what what is the process for okay i'm going to start working on a project or a series uh what yeah. what is the way that you what's the process for when you start one of those for sure well so for example the uh the latest series that i did just before uh microscopic chroma was called murky waters and so mm-hmm. murky waters is um it's a series that i've distilled the color palette down and so there was only uh three primary colors and then a few um like diluted neons in there as well uh, but what what I wanted to do with that particular one was to just um, instead of using like yeah instead of like using this whole thing right. to be like I'm gonna take all of these and we're gonna create a thing I was like I'm gonna very meticulously decide on three different colors here and go from there. Um, but in regards to a theme, the themes and the inspiration only come after I start creating. So um, I am really inspired by this surrealist in regards to automatic working, which basically means that you kind of start the process and then you think about it later or you think about it when it comes when it 
comes to mind. Huh. And so I really, I really liked that. So, you know, the, the going back to just being really curious about color, texture, form, those are the things that influenced the start of a series for me that are very rooted in just like what it means to kind of be an artist, be a, you know, graphic designer. It's like, we really understand color. We really understand these things. And then as the, you know, as my series, as the art progresses, then I start to kind of get influenced by the outside world or something like that. Okay. So, yeah. So murky waters, um, I started to kind of envision that like, um, you know, what would a, like a pond, like what would a pond water look like under a microscope? Like what kind of ecosystems exist at a very microscopic, um, level. And so that sort of, um, that, that switch or that kind of, um, spark happened halfway through the series to be like, now, this work to get to completion is inspired by the microscopic water, like underneath the, in the pond. Mm -hmm. That kind of makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. It, it does. And it made me curious. I'm like, do you have a, and I've actually run into people that have had this, but like an interest in not biology, but uh, science or, it, you know, it's, it, it just seemed like a lot of, and I, it was because I was looking at the murky water one. It just seemed like uh, uh like cells and things, you know, <laughs> it's the, so I was like, I wonder if he has uh, some sort of uh, marine biology sort of interest or I can't think of the proper term, but you know what I mean? Like studying cells and my microbial stop trying to say words. You don't know, Tom. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, but uh, yeah. So do you have an interest in that or is that just kind of what came out of this because of the, the or the process that you were talking about the, what was it? The surreal process called what? Yeah, automatic working. I love that because yeah. that's that's definitely what I do. It'll be like I don't know. Let's do something and see if anything comes of it, and uh, and it will a lot of the time. So I've never heard that explained to me before. So I like that. But anyway, so For sure. do, do you have yeah. any interest, or is there any sort of background or whatever in sort of this microbiology sort of thing, or is it just something that came about because that's what you that's where you went? Hmm. Yeah, so I I always found, um, and this is kind of a like a real, um, well, so from from the ink pieces, like the the paper that I use and the Copic inks as well, mm -hmm. when it dries on the paper, uh, it doesn't bleed through like a traditional canvas, right? So if you use right. watercolor on paper or canvas, you you lose some of the detail when it dries. Uh, with Yupo paper and the Copic ink, it's not the case. So you get every single detail every single ripple of the drying process within those different pieces of information mm -hmm. and so what i found was that um with those materials it can really bring a viewer inward and so i always found that these uh these different kinds of pieces could situate a viewer in relationship to scale whether it's micro or macro um, so for different series like murky waters i was very curious about uh like microorganisms um, you know, and that's just a starting point for, uh, for me to complete the series. But, you know, if a viewer came up to this work and they saw, you know, things that reminded them of something celestial or something in the cosmos, mm -hmm. um, that's welcomed as well. Right. Like I'm okay. not, uh, I'm not an artist that has agency to be like, you know, look at the pond water. Like it's supposed <laughs> to be about the pond water. Yeah. Um, that's just the starting point for me. So, I mean, I really have to give credit to the materials as well, because the, the details are preserved within those pieces that allow somebody to come inward. And so I think that's, um, in, in, uh, like with a lot of science, um, you can kind of, with this work, there is a potential for you to realize that there are larger things than you or smaller things than you and different kinds of ecosystems that operate within our world other than just us human beings navigating our own lives. And so that's what I always kind of hoped is that um, if someone does look at these things and they, you know, they think that they're smaller, it's like, okay, well, what if, like, what is smaller and like, where do you think those things are? Right. And so if it is about murky waters or if it's about, you know, the pond, then it's like maybe you will look at ponds differently. Mm. Or, you know, if you're maybe you're going to look at the sky differently if you start seeing, you know, you know, the Milky Way or celestial bursts or like, you know, that kind of stuff. So um, what I hope is that with um, 
me as the artist being very much interested in the fundamental aspects of art and really just leaning into the capacity of these different materials, bringing people in, it can take their minds uh, in whatever direction they want to go. Mm-hmm. And so that's always the benefit of abstract work is that I can just be very uh, happy with the process of making this work because I love the materials, I love color, I love texture, and then almost being like an artistic middleman to the actual concepts behind the work. Because it, it just allows it to be an invitation to the viewer um, to know that like I, I really just want your mind to go wherever it's going to go. And yeah. you have the freedom to do it. And it's very welcomed, too, as well. I mean, one of one of my greatest joys about being an artist is that if someone actually is honest and vulnerable with me about what they see within the work, it's just it's a very it's just a very wonderful feeling because it's uh, it's so genuine. It's so raw and it's it's very truthful because some of those things that they might see, they might feel stupid saying them. But Mm -hmm. if they don't, then, you know, that allows somebody to be vulnerable with their thoughts and telling the artist that like, hey, I I don't know what this work is about, but this is what I see. And it's like, yeah, that's great. That's all I ask for, honestly, with my work. Right. (laughs) And from that, when did you actually start showing your work publicly, whether it be online or in galleries and things like that? Yeah, I... Well, when I went, when I went back to, uh, like when I went to Halifax, when I was like, I'm going to go back and complete that BFA, uh, I really tried my best to, uh, reach out to international like magazines or something like that. Mm -hmm. Um, so I ended up like, I showed a little bit of my, like, I, I did an interview with, uh, a UK magazine when I was in my third year of my BFA. Nice. Um, back in. 2015 perhaps um and i just i really appreciated the opportunity at that point in time because i just felt uh you know like what do, what do i have to say but here's my thoughts yeah <laughs> um and then yeah my first uh my first couple ex like group exhibitions were uh in ontario um and yeah and then and then i started to yeah, I started to do a little bit of like I started to venture a little bit more into the design side of things uh, while I was getting my master's in Vancouver. So I took on a couple projects with uh, uh, the Vancouver Opera and uh, oh, wow. Herschel Building. Yeah. yeah. So and then um, yeah, I did have the opportunity to to uh, be a part of a group show at the uh, Academy of Fine Art in uh, Krakow, Poland during the pandemic. So I sent. Uh, so you didn't fly over three... there and set up your gallery. <laughs> Unfortunately not. Okay. No, no. Unfortunately, I wasn't there. That's too bad. Um, yeah, yeah. But that and that was uh, some work that I was. Uh, it was experimental printmaking techniques, and uh, the subject matter of those works were uh, the roar shacks. So you know this kind of ink blot uh, yeah. um, technique things. Um, yeah. So uh, you know, I was always kind of exploring like what what abstract forms allow people to think. Um, but yeah, so a, a little bit of stuff here and there, let's say, okay. <laughs> dating back to 2015. Okay, so it does go back that far. When did you start uh, your website? Uh, well, I was actually making websites in high school. So okay. uh, I, yeah, I started, I, I was so fascinated with the idea of like the design side of things to being like, I'm going to create a website and I'm going to piece it together and I'm going to put all the bars in the right place. So I, I was maybe, I was maybe 15 when i made my first website okay nice yeah so (laughs) So it's not a foreign thing to you yeah there's it's it's kind of weird how uh with artists uh website is something that they know they want to do but it's not something that they can get to or it's just something they don't have time for or they don't have the ability for and and Mm -hmm. yeah so it in other people it's just like well i was making websites because i was just goofing around and it's just something like you tinker with and that's, I'm in that category. It's like, I've got like 20 websites and probably more than that, that I just forgot about, you know, <laughs> I'll just yeah. make a website for something like, Oh, I have this idea. And then I'll play with it for a week and forget all about it. Um, <laughs> and when you were sending your work, uh, overseas, uh, it, how, how difficult is it to ship your work? And is that something like, do you have a particular process or, I mean, you just, you just, box it up and <laughs> send it away like how are how are you shipping your stuff because you also sell your work online so there is the I process do. of protecting it 
And uh, mm-hmm. so tell me about shipping it and tell me about uh, selling your work online. Of course. Yeah. And so, yeah, my, my second love is uh, the business side of art. Um, mm-hmm. As much as I love the university uh, art system for for different kinds of things, uh, the things that I always found that they lacked was the actual business side of being an artist once you graduate. Oh, okay. And um, so, so it was always a it was always a personal interest of mine to be like, okay, well, how do I ship things? Like, mm-hmm. what materials do I use to sandwich two drawings together that like doesn't discolor the 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 drawing itself? Um, or like what kind of boxes do I use or like what dimensions are bigger or smaller where you actually get charged an extra fee. So, um, just or like even a fun the fact, service uh, you should you, use to ship with yeah. it. <laughs> Precisely. Yeah. 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 So all of that stuff was quite a, quite an interest to me. And I, I actually had the opportunity to work at a, uh, um, a contemporary museum as well, uh, as a preparator assistant. Um, oh, so handy. I saw a lot of that stuff come in as well, which became, it was just, you know, it was it was stuff that just kind of registered as very valuable information at yeah. the time. Um, but yeah, so I mean, particularly with uh, things that are rolled um, here in Canada, it's kind of silly. But if you roll things and put it in a tube, tubes cost more than a rectangular box of the same size because there is an extra fee for the roll. And I don't know why, but there's these tiny, li- tiny little details of different kinds of things that I've learned throughout the process of shipping work um, that I've kind of tailored towards. Uh, My how only I ship guess things. would be is that you can't stack them properly. Like, whereas you're probably right. Yeah, like they, yeah, they. Yeah. That's the only thing I can think of. Like, they've just got to be a hassle to deal with. Okay, continue. Sorry about yeah. that. I was, I was brainstorming <laughs> no <worries>. there. <laughs> Absolutely. And you know what? Uh, I, I had a really great mentor um, when I was going to school in Calgary that uh, he was very open to a lot of the conversations that were outside of uh, creating the work. So, you know, like sometimes he would give me examples of, you know, I was creating some sculptures and I just brought all the pieces as a carry on luggage bag, hmm. you know, and then it only cost me 40 bucks because I was already going to the exhibition space. And so instead of spending $200 to ship a box, it's like, it's just a carry on. I'm going over there anyways, and we can assemble it. Yeah. You know, so he had like incredibly innovative ways um, to ship work if you're going with it or, you know, sending it with somebody. And yeah. And so in regards to a lot of the work that I do now, I'm really, uh, I'm really conscious of sizing to Mm -hmm. a degree. So, you know, there are boxes that are, specifically a size you know and that's uh that's just i think maybe a little bit of like me wanting things to be uh, a certain way for ease uh and it doesn't limit me in regards to being like okay it's a square like i can create the work in a square i can create a work in a rectangle you know because i don't i don't kind of i don't subscribe to the parameters of landscape and portrait i just create um with with some different things in mind yeah um yeah but yeah in terms of uh in terms of the business side of art in regards to shipping, it is um, it's different kinds of boxes that really are cost effective because it's so expensive to ship things nowadays. It's um, just being aware of uh, the guidelines of a lot of that stuff really does. Um, it helps me feel a little bit more um, attuned to the business that I'm kind of producing, making. Okay. And what are some of the projects that you have coming up or things that you're doing or things you'd like to tell people about as far as uh, work that they can expect from you in the future? Sure. Yeah, I'm uh, currently working through an art grant. Um, really? To develop a series. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it's going to be my largest work to date. I've got uh, seven, seven 20, 20 inch by 30 inch paintings and five seven. 30 inch by 40 inch paintings. Good Lord. Okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I got, I got a lot to do, um, but it's going to be exploring the intersections between painting and three-dimensional collage. Um, Cause I kind of found that to be such a fascinating branch of uh, uh, painting in general, obviously, because, you know, lots of painting is two dimensional and whether you use like design principles to create depth and perspective, it's like, it's very much on one surface. Um, so I'm really curious about the three dimensional aspect of introducing, um, you know, introducing collage into that conversation. Um, but then I've actually been uh, revisiting a lot of uh, surrealist history um, because uh, well, I, with surrealism, even though it's a fantastic uh art medium uh there was a lot of uh 
underrepresented artists, particularly um, female artists of the time that didn't uh, get the the spotlight that I think they truly deserved. And the unfortunate thing about going through a master's is that um, even though history of art is available to you, art history for a long time has been marketing. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you know, different historians, different writers decide what they find of value. And the unfortunate thing of some of the surrealism is the underlying misogyny of the medium that only produced, uh, you know, men that did a great job, right? Um, so uh, the real benefit right now is that there's lots of writers and uh, art historians that are really revisiting a lot of uh, surrealism and producing different articles that really truly highlight a lot of these uh, artists that were uh, underrepresented during the time. And so I'm trying to figure out a way that I can pay homage and kind of do different kinds of odes uh, to these different uh, artists that I find um, have done tremendous work um, in in such a way that uh, it doesn't that it's that it's subtle hints to it. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of the history that's for the grant. And then um, I'm actually revisiting a lot of a uh, monochromatic palette. Hmm. So throughout my master's, it was very, very bright artwork. And I think it was just of the time, right? Because the pandemic was so bleak. And I'm like, okay, well, I'm not going to create bleak work. I need like this, you know, this other side of just like intense color maximalist work. Um, and now uh, I'm revisiting uh, a color palette that is primarily monochromatic, which is actually what I did uh, when I last received a, uh, a grant um, through the uh, Saskatchewan Arts Organization here in okay. Saskatoon. So it's a little bit of cycles. It's a little bit of revisiting. Um, it's a little bit of um, paying homage to underrepresented artists. Um, and at the moment, I think that's I think that's enough to get me started. <laughs> and then uh, you got a few things going. <laughs> to, yeah, totally. Yeah, and then yeah, and then similar to automatic uh, working, you know, I think there'll be different kinds of observations that um, that come into the into the mix while I create the work as well, and then that'll kind of take me to a different part of um, completing these paintings. Okay. And if people wanted to check out your work or if they wanted to follow and see some of these new things that you have coming out, where would you suggest that they go see this? Absolutely. Uh, Instagram is where I'm the most active. Uh, it's all Jordan Baranecki. Um, so, and then I've got all the hyperlinks on my, uh, on my bio as well. So my website stays very up to date with all of the available work, uh, as well as news. Um, they can sign up for my newsletter as well, which is, uh, which is located through my Instagram. Great. All right. Well, I want to thank you so much for talking with me today. It was great meeting you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for your time as well. I really appreciate this.